Hey everybody, welcome to Parkitect Coaster College. Today I just want to make this tutorial for those people who are struggling with coaster building in Parkitect or who just picked up the game and are wondering about how the coaster editor works. So this will be a basic introduction to how to use the track builder in Parkitect to build coasters. Still, I think if you're experienced with the game and you know how to build coasters, there might be some interesting tips and tricks throughout this video as well. So that's something that I want to mention as well. And also, I need to express my debt that I have to Max Freak, who made an earlier tutorial on the coaster builder, and which was a really good video and one of the reasons that I was afraid to get into this. But I think that with the recent addition of the autocomplete feature, um, then his tutorial has become a little bit outdated, so that's why I like to make this video as well and focus especially on how autocomplete works. And also I'll be doing a few things outside of just showing how the coaster editor works. So I also want to show some layouts, for instance, that I've built uh, to point out some tips and tricks uh, and stuff like that. Now without further ado, let's get into it and I'll explain everything along the way. So if we want to build a coaster, Obviously, we need to go to the right section and build a coaster. I'm just going to pick the floorless coaster for now, but the type doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm not going to focus in this video on how to build realistic coasters of specific types or how to get certain excitement ratings, etc. I just want to focus on how to use the builder itself. So for the station, I always like that to be raised off the ground. Uh, Max Freak has also said that this is just going to make it easier to get back to the station at the end of the ride, but it's also very much a realism thing. Uh, real life coasters tend to have their stations raised a little bit. And in scenarios and stuff like that, you can even put some queue lines or exit paths, stuff like that underneath the station as well. So that's always handy. Now here is the track builder itself and the real meat of this tutorial. So when I first saw this, I noticed that it looks very similar to coaster builders from other theme park related games, mostly Roller Coaster Tycoon, because that's my main experience in the genre. Um, but there are some really big differences. And I think the most crucial difference is that uh, the sort of traditional coaster builder that works piece by piece like this uh, uses the UI to let you choose a number of prefabricated track pieces. So for instance, uh, straight to gentle slope pieces and gentle to steep slope pieces, things like that. But this UI, even though it looks very similar, you use it to choose what you want a track piece to be like before you build it. And it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of what you do with it. You can choose the slope, you can choose the curve, and you can choose the uh, banking. And with all of these three combined, you have pretty much limitless options as far as what you can do on a grid. Um, because in the end of, at the end of the day, the game is still based on a grid. So that is a limiting thing. Uh, but aside from that, as long as everything sticks on the grid, you can come up with pretty much anything you want. Something to also note is obviously we see some numbers here uh, with four and four and a half. These are the uh, the height tiles that you use to basically calculate what every slope is going to be like. So for instance, if I keep going straight, we end up at four. Uh, here is the quarter slope up where after two grid tiles, we end up at four and a quarter. Uh, here's the half slope up where we end up at four and a half. And here's the full slope up where we end up at five. And all of these scale accordingly as well. So if we take the quarter, for instance, and uh, make the track piece one grid tile longer, we end up at four uh, three eighths. And another grid tile ends up at four and a half. Uh, whereas if we take the uh, half slope up, if we increase that by just one tile, we end up at four three quarters. And one more tile, we end up at five etc. And this scales up all the way. Uh, that said, the fourth slope up is, I guess, in number a little bit different. Since you can see, it goes from five to seven here. Uh, and by the time you get to four slope up, every single grid space is an entire, uh, well, number in terms of heights. So you can see we go from 10 to 11 to 12, etc. And then at the end, there is vertical, which makes your track go vertical, as the name suggests. So with these all together, 
Uh, it used to be quite finicky because you had to get back into the station without an autocomplete feature. So these numbers used to be extremely important to get back to the exact same height of the station. But nowadays that's not really true anymore since we have the autocomplete feature. So I would say don't be too worried about the numbers. You can usually find your way back to the station height at the end of the ride by autocompleting it as long as you get close enough. Um, but you can still use it as a general guide of knowing you know, how high your track piece is going to be. But we will get into that later. I'll show you how that sort of comes into play. For now, I just want to build a lift hill, which typically is about 30 degrees. So I'm gonna go about a half slope up, which is basically, well, technically it's about 25% it should be since we are moving at two grid tiles and we're moving uh, half a space up. But yeah, I'm just gonna build the lift hill like that. And as I'm building, I'm also gonna increase the length of the track pieces, makes it a little bit quicker, but also means that we don't have too many supports here. And at this point, I think we're pretty safe to end the lift hill here. So I'm just gonna go straight again and remove the lift option here. And now it's time for some drops. Now, something which I think is worth to point out is if you're used to these older piece by piece builders, you would have to sort of do things in steps. So you would first have to go to a gentle slope and then a slightly steeper slope and then an even steeper slope if you wanted to get to the steep slopes. I think that's not only unnecessary in Parktect, but it also makes the coaster a little bit less smooth. And this becomes especially apparent if you don't, uh, if you skip any in between slopes. If we go from this slope to this one, for instance, you can see it becomes very unsmooth here and that's something that we don't really want. So you can go from straight to any sm any kind of slope instantly. So I would just generally recommend to do that instead. So in this case, I'm going to go straight from, well, straight to a steep slope for the first drop. And I think I'm just going to end up at four. Usually I don't like to let my tracks touch the ground. You can obviously do this, but out of realism purposes, I'm gonna keep them raised a little bit because in real life, coasters are usually never touching the ground uh, because they always need to be supported by some kind of support. So I'm just gonna go straight here. And I think it's time for our first element. Uh, just as a word of caution, I want to say that I'm not trying to build a realistic coaster layout here. I just want to try and build as many elements as I can to show you how to make different kinds of elements uh, and how I like to make different kinds of elements. But the final layout is probably going to be a little bit weird. Now for some elements, you can just choose them out of the menu here. So for instance, for a loop, for a vertical loop, we can just choose one in the menu here and scale it according to how big our coaster is. So that's pretty easy. And the same goes for corkscrews, for instance. We just have the corkscrews from the menu here. Um, but for other elements, you're going to want to build them yourself. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a zero G roll, which is basically just a hill with uh, a twist in the middle. And actually, maybe I'm going to build that a little bit taller. Yeah, I probably should. So I'm going to go back into a decently steep slope although no, not quite as steep as this one. And I think just have one straight section here. That should be good. And as you can see, you also don't have to go straight before you want to go down again. You can just click going down right away. So that sometimes helps saves a little bit of time. But in the case of a zero G roll, it makes the roll a little bit smoother um, because you could make a roll by, for instance, doing this building one piece where you start banking upside down and then building another piece where you go straight again. But as you can see, this is not very smooth. So what I usually like to do is just make it one long piece like this and just take the banking and bank it all the way. And that is going to make a twist. And let's see if that makes it with a decent speed. And yeah, I'd say that's perfect. So let's get down to the ground again and build another element. And for this element, I'm thinking of building a Cobra roll because this shows off how the half loop uh, elements work really well. So the half loop is an element that kind of goes straight like this, but you can also choose it to go left like this or right like this. So for a Cobra roll, because I want this to be somewhere around here, 
I'm going to go left first and then go into a corkscrew. And actually, I'm going to bank the end of this corkscrew a little bit as well, which is something that you can do for corkscrews, uh, which makes them super flexible. You can bank them in any way you like. So I'm going to experiment a little bit more with that later. But for now, I'm just going to make the section between the corkscrews a little bit banked because that's something that real life Cobra rolls tend to do. And it just makes the inversion a little bit smoother, I think. And then for the other half loop, I'm going to have that curve to the left. And there you go. That's the Cobra roll. Now over here, I could build a loop, but I think I'm just going to build a simple airtime hill here. So just going to build a hill like this. It's very simple. Pretty much the easiest element to build. And then after that, I think I want to add a mid-course break run over here. Now I need to see if this is actually going to make it. And if so, at what speed? Looks pretty good so far. And yeah, that's perfect. All right, so here I want to add a mid-course break run, as they call it, uh, which is something which in my own playthroughs I rarely do, but I highly recommend that you do this in your longer coasters because this is what you need to get multiple trains onto the coaster. Um, because the train system in Park Tech does follow real life, so you can only have multiple trains on a single coaster if you have block breaks in the middle of the layout or near the end of it. And I can't really, I mean, this is a topic that I could devote a whole video to, but basically coasters work based on blocks and you can only have the number of trains equal to the amount of blocks that you have on the coaster uh, minus one. And a coaster is divided into blocks based on stations, lift hills and block breaks. Um, anything that can stop a train in the middle of the ride divides it up into different blocks. So this is for evacuation purposes. If anything happens to go wrong anywhere, you can stop all of the trains on the blocks. So you always need more blocks uh, or, or more block breaks um, than you have trains just for safety purposes. And this also makes sure that coaster cars can never crash into each other because only one train is allowed on a single block at any given time. That's why we need to add these block sections as well, just to make the coaster, coasters a bit more efficient and allow us to add multiple trains on them. So I'm going to add some block breaks here, and I like to trim the speed if the next block is clear, which makes sure that even if there's no car on the next block, it still breaks it a little bit, which you don't have to do, but I like to do that just to control the speed a little bit. So as you can see, it's getting braked there. Is that? Yeah, you say braked. Um, and if there happened to be another train on this block and this block wasn't cleared yet by the next train, this train would be stopped on these brakes until the next train would be in the station and then it would let go of the brakes and go down here. Now I'm just going to go into a drop here and finish the rest of the ride off with some other kinds of little elements that I want to show off. So first, uh, maybe we might just want to build a loop even though we aren't quite at a very good height anymore. I think it's still very doable. Let me test that. Never mind. I forgot all about the fact that we are on a one slope down piece. So if I expand this by one grid piece, we'll be at three and a half, which should be a good height to build the loop at and make sure that we clear it with a decent speed. Let's check that. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to add another airtime hill here, just because airtime hills are fun. Uh, can't have too many of those, I guess. Although, actually, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller on the top here, just like that. And, wow, that actually goes over the uh, station quite nicely. And then one of the last things that I want to build is a corkscrew. And I think it'll be nice to just build a regular old corkscrew. I'm going to have to worry about getting back to the station because I kind of pre-planned which elements I wanted to build, but not exactly how the layout would go. But I'm sure that'll be fine. Uh, so yeah, here's our corkscrew. And something else which I think is really interesting about the corkscrews, like I pointed out earlier, you can change the banking on these things however you want, which is not the case for half loops. You always need to be at perfectly 180 or uh, zero degrees for those. Uh, but for corkscrews, you can use them to build, for instance, overbanked uh, turns. So you can build something like this, 
get back to zero and you basically have an overbanked turn like this. Or you can even uh, go back to a straight piece and go back to zero banking like that. And as you can see, you can make what's almost kind of a stengel dive. Just really interesting elements. And just like that, I think kind of thinking outside of the box and using different curves and inversion pieces together with the banking and even the sloped pieces works really well to come up with anything that you like. And the same does go for slopes as well for corkscrews um, because you can add a corkscrew after a quarter or a half slope up. So as you can see, I can still build a corkscrew after this, although I can't get back to a different slope with another corkscrew after that. In any case, I think it's actually probably the best to get into maybe an overbanked turn over here. Not quite sure how that would work out, but I'm sure there must be a way. Uh, that said, uh, if you have less than 90 degrees banking, the, not the other corkscrew that comes after it, the game thinks that you want to go up again. So that's something to be aware of. If you want to make overbanked curves like this, you do need to get 95 or more degrees of banking on the corkscrew. Thank you, Rain. That is perfect for tutorial purposes. Okay, we're back. And I think I might actually want to try and build a helix here, which is the final element that I would have liked to get into this layout. So this is where curves that go up and down come in. As you can see with curves, you can also change the slope however you want. That said, you cannot build the steepest slope with a curve. It'll just go straight like that. Um, and also if you go into a curve while you're uh, also having a sloped piece, as you can see, it gets very steep really quickly. So you always have to take into account that curves will make you go down quite a bit faster than straight sloped pieces will. So in this case, because I want to build some kind of helix, I'm going to go back to a piece like that. Uh, God, I don't know if that's actually going to work out. Yeah, I think it does all right. And looks pretty weird but I'll take it. And then finally, the uh, S-band pieces are something that you can very easily use to get from any, you know, not quite connecting to the station tile, uh, to a tile which directly lines up to the station like this. And I haven't shown off a lot of the autocomplete feature yet, but I think that I will have to do that on this final segment because I want to have a slight banking over here, uh, but then I also want a smooth piece that hooks back up to the station. And I can do this with either four tiles of a quarter slope up, as you can see, uh, where we get back to four, or uh, two tiles of a half slope up to get back to four. Now, obviously in this case, I think that the four tiles of a quarter slope up looks quite a bit smoother, so I want to go for that. Uh, but not just that, I think this is a bit of an awkward transition. I think the banking over here ends a little bit too abruptly. So what you can do, as long as the difference in height between two track pieces is small enough, the game will automatically connect them. So as you can see here, this half height isn't quite enough for the game to automatically connect these two track pieces. Um, but if I build a quarter slope up, it's automatically going to connect them like this and we get one smooth track piece where it goes from a banked to a straight piece that's half a tile higher. And that just makes the whole piece a little bit more uh, smooth. And really the only way to build like this is with the autocomplete feature. So even though the autocomplete feature is originally meant to just help you get back to the station without having to worry about the numbers too much, I think this also just makes for really smooth track pieces. And with a bit of manipulation, you can make some uh, track sections which are otherwise impossible to make in the game work. And, uh, oh, I actually forgot to get rid of the banking over here. All right, let me fix that. Get back to zero, go back to that, and then hook up the two track pieces in the end. There we go. And at the end of the ride, I just want to add some more block breaks. Although, actually, I do have the mid-course block breaks, so it doesn't matter too much. I should be able to get two trains like this add uh, an entrance 
and an exit. That is basically it for our first coaster layout. And these are some of the most basic elements to build and how to build them. And for the rest of this tutorial, I just want to go over some other things to keep in mind and some potential layouts that you might be able to learn from. So first, a little bit more about the autocomplete feature. As long as the height difference between the track piece that you're building and the track piece you want to connect to is less than a quarter, I believe, and regardless of banking or sloping, the game is going to auto-connect them. So here, for instance, I'm going to build a two-tile straight piece, but it's still going to hook it up to this difference of one-eighth in height. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And also, as you might have noticed, it really doesn't matter what kind of banking or anything like that you have. So if I make this piece bank, for instance, and I try to connect it to the station piece here with a piece that goes up, so the piece doesn't end up straight, the game is just automatically going to figure out how to best connect these two pieces and we get this interesting sort of banked to straight slope transition piece as a result of that. Another trick that I personally like to use is having one piece that goes from a certain slope up to a different kind of slope down. So as you might be able to notice, um, we can only go to a half slope down in one piece if we are at a half slope up. But one way to circumvent this is to just build a single piece like this, then build another straight piece, and then have a quarter slope down piece, for instance. And if we remove the things in between, we can have a single piece that goes from a half slope up to a quarter slope down. Anyway, I hope that short tutorial gave you some ideas. Now for the final part of this video, I want to go over some layouts that I made myself. Uh, just to show you some of the tricks that I've used and um, yeah, how, how to basically make use of the coaster builder to make smooth and realistic layouts. So for this coaster, for instance, I think something that's really interesting to point out is the drop that we have over here. Basically, we are going at the lift hill from um, a, a half slope up piece to or a half tile up piece to uh, a full tile down slope. And then from that, this curve transitions to a quarter tile downslope. Uh, and then this other curve transitions to uh, just a straight slope. So with that, you get this sort of general pretty smooth curve that goes from a slope down to uh, a straight piece. And then finally, a diagonal piece into this diagonal looping. And I think that just works to you know make the whole coaster seem a little bit less on grid which for me at least is always something that I try to do as much as possible. Also at the end, there's another one of these pieces where as you can see, it goes from a piece at four and a half height here to four, while at the same time unbanking in a single track piece. So that was what I thought was worth showing off for that coaster. Uh, this is an Intamin Megalite, which is something that you don't see too much in the game, but I think it's decently possible. Uh, and it uses the corkscrew piece actually. This is, believe it or not, a corkscrew piece uh, to create this very large overbanked curve here and then another corkscrew piece over here to create this small overbanked curve and then the rest of the ride is just very simple. Some airtime hills just to end the ride because these coasters tend to be very focused on airtime Whereas these inverted coasters tend to really just focus on getting uh, many inversions. And then finally, here's uh, a flying coaster, which I think work especially well with this coaster builder. Uh, because flying coasters tend to have flying segments where you're underneath the track and uh, lying segments where you're uh, above the track. So here at the bottom of this pretzel loop, there's a, there's a lying track and you pretty much get all the creativity that you want in terms of the banking. Um, so most of these elements are quite simple. Here's another uh, zero G roll, for instance. Uh, here's a piece that uses a curve. This is actually a curve that goes from steep to straight to create a dive loop. Uh, but also here the track is straight for a section and then it just has a 180 twist to go from a lying position to a flying position. Uh, so that's something that works really well uh, with this coaster builder in particular, I think. Because these flying coasters tend to have really interesting elements uh, where they just go from a lying position to a flying position. So 
lots of creativity is possible there. This is also another corkscrew, I believe. Okay, no, this is actually not a corkscrew. This is just a curve uh, that goes into a single track section here where it goes from flying to lying. So yeah, lots of interesting possibilities, especially with how you can use banking to kind of repurpose elements, I think. Anyway, that's it for this tutorial. I hope you learned something from this or got some ideas for your own coasters. And if you have any requests or questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section. I do have to say, uh, very honestly, I don't think I'll make more tutorials on coasters in Park Tech because um, it's quite simple, really. Uh, and I'm already doing a series in Planet Coaster on how to make specific kinds of roller coasters. And even though the coaster builder is very different, I think the overall design philosophy of the coaster types just carries over into this game because all of the coasters are built on real life counterparts. Anyway, that's it for this video and I hope to see you guys in the next Park Tech scenario video maybe. Bye bye.